Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and uh, good afternoon to everybody. So I will continue this course about the flatness approach for the control of PDEs. And so um, I remind you that we introduce what is the flatness approach for ODEs and we apply next the flatness approach for the, the new controllability of the heat equation in dimension one and next on cylinders, also for Schrodinger equation. And the last time we uh, were interested at the end with the new controllability of weakly degenerate parabolic equation. So uh, the program of today, of the course of today, is to look at the uh, new controllability of strongly degenerate parabolic equation, so this part. And next, uh, we will consider uh, the, the reachable states, first for the boundary control of the heat equation, and next for the distributed control of the heat equation. And we'll start uh, to look at the reachable states for the cartovec de Vries equation. This is the program for today. So let's go to this part, and let, let us complete this part 2.4. Okay, so... Uh, we had a look at this result, hein? I remind you, so we had some parabolic equation and we assume that A, uh, the coefficient A in the principal part, satisfied um, this assumption. And so typically it is true when A is in L1 and 1 over A is in L1. Hein? We can apply it with uh, P equal to. And so we had some uh, numerical simulation for the case of a discontinuous uh, coefficient. So when A is discontinuous, we, we add some uh, look at that the last time. And now let us have a look at the numerics about so some heat equation with um, a weakly degenerate coefficient, which is written in red. So it's x to the gamma, where gamma is between 0 and 1. So it is a weakly degenerate heat equation. And we will assume that we control precisely at the place where it is degenerate, that is at x equals zero. So the control is put at x equals zero uh, uh, with this form. And at the over end, uh, okay, there is no control. So you, we take gen uh, quite general uh, Robin condition uh, with uh, this form. Okay. And the numerics obtained by uh, my colleague uh, Philippe Martin are the following. So uh, for the initial data, we take this one. So it is discontinuous. Uh, it is uh, the, the curve in blue. Okay. And we make uh, several simulations with different value of gamma. I remind you that gamma is the power of uh, in the degeneracy. Okay. So when gamma is one half, we obtain this thing. When gamma is zero, gamma is zero corresponds to the classical heat equation. So uh, the initial data is this one, okay? So uh, it corresponds to the time t equals zero. So this is the time. So t equals zero is this place, and the space is along this axis. So x be, um, varies between zero and one, okay? So this is the classical heat equation here, and the control is applied at x equals zero. So it is applied exactly here, okay? So we obtain this simulation when gamma is zero. Now, this thing is a little bit more degenerate, so we have gamma equal one half. So this is the initial data, this is the control. And you see that you have some oscillation, okay? And this part is more degenerate, so gamma is two over three. And okay, we see that you have more oscillations, but we can make it, okay? It it works well by applying a theory, and so we have all the machine we, so we have some theoretical result which tells you that you can control to zero. But uh, this kind of result was already known. But at, at the same time, we have a way to construct uh, numeric, uh, numerical solutions just by uh, considering partial sum in our series. Okay, so let us pass now to a more complicated case, which is the case of strongly degenerate parabolic equation. And it is a joint work with uh, my colleague Antoine Benoit and my PhD student uh, Romain Loyer uh, at uh, Calais. And uh, this uh, work was published uh, last year in uh, SIM COCV. So we consider this kind of parabolic equation in which uh, you have three coefficients. You have A of X, which is in the principal part, huh? in the second order derivative. Next, you have a potential Q of X in front of, of U. 
And finally, you have a coefficient in front of, of the derivative in time. Okay. So it's quite similar to the case we considered before, except that we don't have, we didn't put any coefficient in ux, in front of ux. Okay. So you, you have zero in front of ux. Okay. Um, and, uh, okay. So at, at the left, we consider this, uh, generalized, uh, Neumann condition and we assume that, uh, it is homogeneous. So it takes the value zero and we consider that the control is applied at x equal one with a, a very general, uh, uh, Robin condition. Okay. And you start from u zero. So here, uh, alpha and beta are, uh, uh, any uh, couple of, uh, uh, real numbers, uh, which is different from zero, zero, so that uh, this uh, uh, condition has a sense and is a, has a real sense. And we start from, uh, say, L2, and we want to apply some control, which is in L2, so the classical thing. So what we want to do is to obtain the new controllability. Huh? Okay. And so what are the difficulties? The difficulty is that uh, we will consider the situation where A can be strongly degenerate so typically, the example that we should have in mind is a of x is x to the 2 minus epsilon, where epsilon is very small. So it's almost uh, the power 2 that you have uh, for, uh, for x. Okay, So it's almost x uh, squared, but not exactly, because x squared is not a load. Okay? So you have just a, 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 some power which is less than 2. And at the same time, uh, q... Uh, may be singular. So it is not necessarily bandlid. It, it could be something like x to the minus epsilon. Okay. So we, have, we can have both some uh, strongly degenerate coefficient a and some singular uh, potential q. So I remind you the, the previous result. So uh, typically when a of x is x to the 2 minus epsilon, for epsilon between one and two, it corresponds to the weak situation. And for epsilon between zero and one, it is a strong situation, the strong degeneracy. And it was investigated. Uh, so, um, by Canarsa, Martinez, and Marcus de Noble, as it proves that uh, we have the new controllability. And uh, in the series uh, of papers from uh, 2008 to 2020, and the, the main ingredient were the Karman estimate. Uh, we had as a result for more general A, so the, 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 the coefficient in the, which is a strongly degenerate, uh, by Franelli and Muniai, although uh, in a long series of papers from uh, 2016 to 2021. And the main assumption that the coefficient A was in W11, so it was smooth, and it was at least, at least continuous. And also you have the assumption that a of x divided by x to the gamma for some gamma is a non-decreasing function. So you have some mo some monotonicity assumption that are made about A, and this technical assumption actually are needed to construct to to uh, to derive a Karman estimate. So you have some technical assumption. Uh, first uh, regularity and next some monotonicity to uh, to be able to uh, to obtain some Karman estimate, but a, a is more general than this one, of course. Uh, I remind you that when a is uh, in the class L infinity uh, and uh, assuming assuming that a of x is strictly larger than some positive constant alpha, you have the the, the good result by Alessandrini and R. Corgiasa uh, using a complex analysis. Okay, and uh, in our previous result, we were able to to uh, take into account, for instance, the situation where a and one over a are both in L one. So it was able to to obtain a theory for that by using the flatness approach. And also, uh, uh, the flatness approach was uh, applied by uh, Ivan Moyano in two thousand sixteen to deal with the situation where a of x is x to uh, the x uh, to to uh, to two minus uh, epsilon uh, for so for we see the power exactly as in the case uh, considered by Canarsa, Martinez and the constable okay so this is the literature and okay so we will make some uh, assumption so 
some uh, the first assumption tells you just that a and rho are strictly positive for almost every x well, which is quite natural so i remind you what is what are the coefficients so a is the coefficient is the principal part and rho is the coefficient in front of of ut well, typically rho is one in practice okay so we have this assumption we, we cannot avoid them so next, A is uh, locally uh, integrable, of course. And okay, the main assumption we, we do is the following. The map which to X uh, um, uh, associate X uh, over A of X is in some class LP for some strictly positive, for some uh, P larger than one. So X over AX is in LP. And this is the main assumption. Okay, so if you uh, try uh, A of X e equal X, to the two minus epsilon, of course, you have this assumption for a good p. This is it, our main assumption. So for rho, we assume that rho is some class LR and that the limit sub of rho is uh, finite when x tends to zero. We have this assumption, which is uh, about a, which is difficult to um, to interpret actually, but it, it turns that it is satisfied when a of uh, x is x to the two minus epsilon. So, and actually we need it to obtain some generalized RD inequality. So this is quite a technical assumption, but uh, not very conservative. And finally, we have this assumption about Q, about the potential Q. Uh, we have to assume the existence of some uh, function V in W11 of zero T satisfying. So this elliptic equation where you have Q here, uh, this boundary condition at zero, and, uh, and we, we need also this V to be strictly positive. So in all these assumptions, P is strictly larger than one, R is larger than P prime, and P prime is the conjugate uh, exponent to P. And uh, okay, so this assumption, uh, okay, can be uh, fulfilled in uh, at least two situations. We can prove that it is satisfied when you have this uh, condition. So this integral, when this integral is less than one. So this integral um, uh, take into account both a of x and q. Huh? So it makes in some sense a connection between the degeneracy a and the potential function q. And so this integral has to be less than one. So it's a first possibility. When you have that, you can prove the existence of v. And another possibility is, is when uh, Q of X is less than some constant, positive constant time rho. So typically when rho is one for a, any X, so it means that uh, Q is bounded from uh, above. But Q can take the very negative value. Okay. So in these two situations, okay, you can construct V. And actually V is needed to get rid of uh, Q by making a change of uh, function. So we can simplify the equation as we did actually uh, uh, in the weekly degenerate case. Okay, so we make all these assumptions. So the main assumption is this one. Huh? To my opinion, this is uh, the most important assumption that we do. And of course, so we, we, A can be discontinuous and we don't have any uh, uh, monotonicity uh, assumptions about A. It can be uh, very general. So our result is the following. So the result obtained with uh, uh, Antoine Benoit and uh, Romain Loyer. So assume that uh, all the coefficients uh, satisfy uh, the, the assumption above, and you uh, you take uh, s between one and one plus one over p prime minus one over r, then you can construct a function h which is in the Jouvray class the G S such that when you apply this Jouvray function as a control input at x equal one. Uh, starting from u0, uh, you arrive at uh, 0 at the final time, capital T. That is, you have some new controllability result uh, for the initial uh, in the class L2 of rho that I will define uh, later, but it's just uh, the L2 space for the, the measure rho of x dx. And by using the control input, which is in the Jouvray class uh, gs when s is in this interval. And of course, this interval is not empty, thanks to the assumption we did with, uh, uh, with R and P. This is the result. So how to prove it? I will give you so the 
some idea about the proof. So the first thing to do is to uh, get rid of uh, the zero of the term. So we want to assume that Q is zero. So by assumption, you have the existence of this function V, uh, so that uh, solution of this elliptic equation, this boundary condition at X equals zero, and V is strictly positive everywhere. Okay, and V is uh, in W11. So we use uh, this change of function. So it's uh, we, here we don't change uh, variable uh, X, huh? as we did uh, in the weekly degenerate case, we just change the function. So we set u hat equal u over v, a hat is v squared times a, and rho hat is v squared times rho. And by uh, using very uh, elementary computation, we arrive to this equation. So in the new equation, we don't have q times u hat. Okay, so q disappears, uh, and we just have uh, this uh, boundary condition at zero. So in what follows, we can assume that Q is zero. Okay, so this is the first step to simplify the thing. So we can assume that Q is zero. So next, okay, we are left with the, the control of this system. And uh, as in the weekly degenerate case, we have to first investigate the corresponding elliptic problem. So we have to cons uh, consider this elliptic equation. Huh? Uh, with this boundary condition at zero and this boundary condition at one. Okay, so uh, we will see that it is well posed in uh, appropriate spaces, and we will have a look uh, as though at the spectral problem. And uh, okay, so these are the, the next slide. But first, we need some uh, generalized RD inequality, and it is, it comes in several places in the analysis. And so we have to introduce some space with uh, a weight. This was done actually by Franelli and Nunyai, uh, and also in other papers, but okay, our, our framework is quite general huh, because we don't have a, I, I remind you that A uh, is not necessarily continuous. Huh? Okay, so we introduce this uh, space. So you take H A is the space of function U, which are locally in W11, such that the square root of A times U prime is in L2, and as well U in at uh, X equal one is zero. And you handle this space with this norm, a classical uh, L2 norm with the, the weight, uh, with a measure A of x dx. And okay, you can prove that it is uh, uh, some Hilbert space, it's not uh, difficult. Okay, and for this space, you can uh, prove some RD inequality. So you extend A for uh, x larger than 1. I remind you that between 0 and 1, it is your coefficient in the in the strongly degenerate part, huh? but you extend uh, for convenience for x larger than one by say x square, huh? so that when you divide by a, you are some integral which is convergent up to infinity, and you introduce this function b of x is a of x uh, to the minus one times uh, uh, okay the the square of the inverse of this uh, integral, okay. And if we go back to the assumption I did, I go back to this, okay, we make this assumption, and thanks to this assumption, what we obtain that uh, b tends to plus infinity when x tends to zero. Okay, this uh, assumption is uh, appears at this place, and it will be used later on to get compactness. And okay, and we have the following. This is the generalized art inequality. Uh, so you have a control of u by in, in some uh, weighted L2 space by uh, 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 some L2 uh, weighted space, weighted norms of U prime. Okay, so you control U by U prime in some appropriate uh, uh, weighted spaces. This is a generalized RD inequality. Okay, so you have that. And next, so you have to look at what we call the spectral problem. Okay, and so. It's time now to introduce the spaces. So L2 of rho is just so the space of function f from 0, 1 to r, such that the integral of f square rho is finite, the integral between 0 and 1. So it's just a space L2 for the measure rho of x dx. And h L rho is the, the space of function uh, locally in W11 of 0, 1, such that the square root of a times u prime is in L2, and also the square root of rho times u is in L2. So it means that it's a sort of sobolet space, but you put rate 
uh, in front of of u prime square and in front of of u uh, x square. And so you look at the more general situation. So you put coefficient here and here, and this coefficient can be uh, discontinuous and bounded. Okay, well, okay, you okay, you introduce these spaces. So it, with uh, all the assumptions we did before, you can prove that. Uh, this uh, subordinate space uh, H A rho actually is included in L two and also in L two rho, and that the embedding are compact. You can prove that, and for this we use uh, the R D inequality. So uh, with that, you are able actually to investigate your elliptic problem. So this elliptic problem, you you can uh, okay, give the existence and uniqueness of U for appropriate F. So you can make it. And the next step, of course, is to pass to the spectral problem. And okay, you can prove this thing. So you can prove the existence of some orthonormal basis in the space L2 rho, uh, uh, EN, such that EN sat uh, satisfies uh, this uh, spectral uh, system for any N. And so um, EN is a uh, eigenvalue and lambda N is associated, no, sorry, uh, EN is a uh, eigenfunction and lambda n is the associated eigenvalue. Okay, so uh, you have the existence of uh, this, uh, uh, the solution of this spectral problem, but you need more, actually it's not sufficient, and this is done in the next theorem. Uh, and so you, you can refine, so uh, we obtain more regularity, so here n is, we can prove that it is in W11, so there is no rate here, and A E n prime is actually in W1R. Well, we can prove that. And, okay, what is important now is the estimate was that we have. So we need to estimate both for the L infinity norm of E n. So we can prove that it's bounded some, some constant time, some power of lambda n. So we have a link between the L infinity norm of the eigenfunction and some power of the eigenvalue. We prove that. And next, okay, uh, and the, 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 maybe the, the, the more difficult uh, task is to prove some estimate for the eigenvalue. So you know that for classical um, uh, elliptic problem in dimension one, lambda n behaves more or less like uh, n square in dimension one. Huh? Here, what we can prove that lambda n is larger than some constant time some n to some power kappa. And kappa can be close to two, but well, for, for the moment, we cannot prove that we, we can have kappa equals two, even if it is what we expect. So the, it is not a spectral gap. We, we don't say anything between uh, the difference of the lambda n. Okay, we, uh, but what we say is that lambda n grows like at least like a power of n, and it will be sufficient for what we want to do later on. And it is not so easy. So some slide about uh, the proof of that, and it is uh, the, the technical part of this work. So I remind you that we use a preferred transform for the weakly degenerate equation. Here we use a modified preferred transform. So we put some power of lambda n uh, when we pass to the polar coordinate, okay? So we use this, uh, this, uh, this power of lambda n for both A, E, N prime and E, N. We can see by uh, elementary computation that uh, theta N, uh, the, the phase, uh, satisfies this ODE. Okay? And so you, you can integrate this uh, ODE between 0 and 1 by uh, using also this condition. And you obtain this equation. Okay? We had some equations similar to that in, uh, in the weekly degenerate case. But what is new is that, okay, this part is okay because rho is L1, so uh, this thing is, is, is nice, okay. But this part is uh, not so nice because here we don't know that 1 over A is uh, integrable. It, it is not integrable in general. When A of X is X uh, uh, to the 2 uh, minus epsilon, it is not in L1. So you can have some problem actually at x equals zero, but it turns out uh, theta of theta n at zero is pi, uh, is pi over two. So this guy actually is small as well when uh, uh, when x is close to zero, and it will balance in some sense a. Okay, so you have, you have to prove that actually you don't have problem, and 
And this is te quite technical, but the idea is that we split this integral into two parts. So we integrate uh, close to uh, zero, and after we consider the remaining part of the, the integral, and we split uh, by using actually the eigenvalue. So this is reflecting using the frequency. Uh, and this thing tends to zero when n tends to infinity, so we are closer and closer to zero. And okay, we can prove that we can manage this integral when we are close to zero, but it is quite technical. We had to work hard for that. So after it's quite easy when you have all this uh, result at hand. So the machine we now is uh, the, the same. So we consider so uh, this equation as, as tell you. So uh, you will expand the solution as uh, a series involving a flat output and a generating function. So the generating function are defined by using uh, this equation. So they are defined in uh, by induction. The, the first, um, so for G0, you use this equation. And for the, the next one, for uh, i larger than one, you use this equation. So you can compute gi when you know g1 minus one, and you always take this boundary condition at x equals zero. Okay. So you just compute primitive. Okay. Of course, you have to prove estimates. And so we prove that we have uh, some estimate for the w11 norm of gi and also the w1r norm of a gi x and you apply this thing and what is important is that the exponent here is larger than one and of course it is important after to to get a uh, convergence and over property which is now classical you have a connection between the generating function gi and the eigenfunction en so you can expand the eigenfunction in terms of the generating function gi now, so we, 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 okay, now we can complete the, the process. So you take any initial data, you expand it in terms of the eigenfunction. Of course, you can make it because you have some orthonormal basis of uh, eigenfunction. You pick some s between one and one plus one over p prime minus one over r. And next, you, you do take a, a sort of cutoff function, uh, phi, which is in the Jouvray class gs where s in uh, this interval. So your phi is one for uh, time close to zero, and it is zero for time close to capital T. And what you do after, you take as flat output, you just take uh, the, uh, the the data, the directly data at x equals zero, and it is this thing, and you multiply by your cutoff function. Okay? So this is your flat output y, and next, for uh, the, the, the definition of your trajectory, so you take this series uh, involving the flat output, all the derivative of the flat output and the generating function for the strictly positive time. And at time t0, you take u0. And what you can see is that this series actually uh, coincide with the classical uh, um, expansion in terms of the eigenfunction for t less than capital T over three, you can prove that. So these two expressions match, they are the same. It gives you the same function. And so when T tends to zero, of course, you arrive to this function. Huh? Okay, because you have a, for T between zero and capital T, you have a solution, a solution of the free problem. And for the control input, you just take the trace, so there is, there is no difficulty. And you can prove that it is in the class. Okay. So we pass now to another part, the part uh, concerned with uh, reachable states. And I will first talk about a joint work with uh, Philippe Martin and Pierre Rouchon in uh, 2016. And uh, it's about the reachable states for boundary control of the 1D heat equation. And uh, after the result, after uh, telling uh, a few words about the result obtained in this paper, I will talk about the sharp result obtained by other people more recently. Okay, so we say that the state theta one is reachable from zero in time t for the heat equation if you can uh, design two control input h zero and h one in L two, say in L two, such that when you apply this control input at zero and one, uh, you steer your system from zero to the state theta one. Okay, so you start from zero, you arrive to your state theta one, 
by selecting appropriate control. And if it is the case, we say, you say that theta one is switchable. Of course, this uh, kind of uh, property is uh, related to the exact controllability. Huh? So you can mix uh, switchable states with uh, null controllability to obtain some exact controllability result in some appropriate space. So this problem was actually investigated for a very long time. So I think it can be traced back to uh, Fattorini and Russell in, uh, in their very famous uh, paper uh, in uh, 1971, where they prove, they, they give a very beautiful proof of the null controllability of the heat equation by using by orthogonal series. Um, but uh, also at the same time, they investigate the reachable uh, state problem. And what they prove that, okay, uh, if you expand theta one as a Fourier series like this, so you, you know that uh, the coefficient CN are uh, uh, square integrable, okay? But assume more, assume that you are, you have this, uh, the, the, the convergence of this series in which you are some exponential. So it means that CN has to go to zero in a very fast way. So if you have that, you can reach uh, the state uh, theta one. They prove that. And they said in, the, in this very good paper. Actually, uh, they noticed that actually that for such states, uh, 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 these states actually can be extended as some holomorphic function on some bond, some horizontal bond like this. Huh? So some bond which is a neighborhood of the real axis. They prove that. Okay. So uh, it means that these states actually uh, are holomorphic in a very uh, large domain. And this criterion was uh, improved more recently by uh, Sylvain Hervé-Douza and uh, Enrique Zouazoua in 2011, and they proved that it is sufficient to have this condition. And this condition is really weaker than this one because you don't have the epsilon, okay? So you have, we can prove that this condition in blue implies the condition in red, really. Okay. So these are nice results and difficult one, okay? But uh, if you look at both conditions, actually, uh, you can see that uh, for theta one, you have this condition. Th theta one has uh, to have a derivative of uh, order 2p, 0 at 0 and 1. For every p, for every uh, integer p, the derivative of order 2p has to be 0 and 0 and 1. And now it's an easy exercise to see that uh, no non trivial polynomial function can satisfy this condition. It's a very easy exercise. So, um, so you know that your function has to be analytic, but you cannot reach polynomial function by this criterion. And it is a concern because uh, we, we, you are expected to, to be able to, to reach a polynomial function. So let us have a look now at the result we obtain. And I, I modify slightly uh, the control. Uh, so I consider uh, as um, as domain minus one one instead of zero one is just to simplify the exposition. Uh, the exposition will be uh, more simple uh, by uh, assuming that the control is applied at minus one and one instead of zero and one. But of course, you can have result in zero one just by making a translation or or hypothesis very easy. Okay, so the, the, the first result we, I obtained with uh, Martin and Rochon is the following. So I, I consider so control uh, of the heat equation uh, at minus one and at one, and the, the control domain is a minus one one. Okay, and uh, we so I did not buy whole uh, uh, of omega the set of holomorphic function or complex analytic function in the domain omega, uh, so some open set in C. And we prove the following. We prove that if R is larger than R0, which is defined by this number, which is uh, slightly uh, larger than 1.2. Uh, so if theta 1, so it is actually this, uh, this blue domain, so this ball with a reduce which is slightly larger than 1, okay? So if theta 1 uh, can be uh, extended in some holomorphic function in this blue domain, then you can reach it from zero in any time t. So by applying a control at minus one and one, you can reach it. So provided that your function is uh, uh, analytic in this ball. Okay. Of course, well, it's better because you can 
have uh, with these results the controllability of polynomial function and more. Huh? So is the domain of analyticity is of course uh, uh, smaller, much smaller than when you have a bond. And conversely, any reachable state huh, actually uh, belongs to, is holomorphic on uh, the red square. The red square is a uh, the set of z equal x plus i y where. Uh, the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y is less than 1. And it's a way to define this red square. So if you can reach a state theta 1, it can be extended as an allomorphic function on this uh, red square. And actually, this result was proved a long time ago by uh, Gevray in 1926, even if it has not raised in terms of control problem, but it, it, it was the proof was contained in, in his uh, very old uh, result. Okay, so this thing is since it was not new. Okay, so you have to, we obtain this thing. So we have a necessary condition: if you can reach the state theta one, it can be extended as some holomorphic function on this, and conversely, if you can uh, extend theta one as some holomorphic function of the ball. You can reach it. Okay. So this is for two control. Now assume that you have only one control. And for one control, I take as a domain 0, 1. So x is between 0, 1. So at x equals 0, I put uh, some uh, homogeneous directly boundary condition. And at x equals 1, I, I have my uh, control, which is not, which is not 0. We start from 0. And what we notice is that the reachable states need to be hard in the sense that uh, when you make the extension to minus one, uh, the function has to be hard. So we prove the following. If you have still a function which is a, a function theta one, so at the beginning theta one is defined between zero and one. But if it can be extended as some holomorphic function on the blue ball, with the same radius, so r is larger than r zero is 1.2. And if in addition, theta 1 is odd for this extension, this extension is odd. I mean, theta 1 of uh, uh, minus z is minus theta 1 of z. Then theta 1 is reachable from 0 in any time t. Okay? And conversely, if you have a reachable state, uh, theta 1, it, has to, it, it can be uh, extended as some holomorphic function of the square, still the same square as before, and this extension is odd with respect to zero. So still, we have a necessary condition, so it has to be uh, odd and uh, complex analytic in this uh, square, which is red, and a sufficient condition, it is sufficient that it is odd and uh, analytic, holomorphic, on the blue ball. This is what we obtain at this time. So with result, okay, we see that first that any polynomial function is uh, reachable, so it is a good, good thing. And so I remind you what is the definition of a Jevray function. A Jevray function y is just a function which is of a class C infinity such that the derivative y to the n is less than some constant time factorial of n to the s divided by r n for uh, some constant c and r. Huh? And for the sufficient part, I mean, uh, when we had a function that were uh, analytic on a ball, uh, the controls we constructed were actually uh, Jevray of order two. And we obtained control Jevray of order two. And so, also some comments bet between the difference, uh, for the difference between the controllability to the trajectory and, uh, and the, the exact controllability, actually, so, I, you, everybody knows that for the heat equation, uh, by using Karman estimate, you can obtain the controllability to zero or the controllability to the trajectory. But uh, typically, when you look at the trajectory, you, you can see that you obtain function Jevray of uh, order one, one half. So typically, like exponential of c uh, x squared. And it is less uh, precise than the result we obtain here, because here we, we can reach uh, functions that are just complex analytics, that is Jevray of order one, and with also possible poles. We can have poles. So uh, outside the, the ball, we can have poles. Okay. 
So to prove that, we use flatness approach, okay, as above, and also borel reed theorem. So the flatness property, we use the flatness property, I remind you, for the control of the heat equation in dimension one, but it was limited to the case S less than two, and here we have to consider the limit case S equal two, and we obtain the following with no loss. So we, you assume that uh, the, 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 the flat output Y as derivative uh, less than this quantity. So uh, it means that Y is a uh, of order two, but okay, this is make precise. This is written this way. And you, you construct, you, you, you build your trajectory this way. And you can prove that theta is well defined for X between zero and one. Okay. Uh, so if there is no loss for the reduce in space. This is important. So, because R was any number strictly larger than one. Okay, so almost no loss. And so you obtain this way a solution of your ill pose problem uh, with uh, so the directly data, which is uh, Y, and the Neumann data, which is zero at X equals zero. And next, we have what we call a Borel Reed theorem. So, everybody knows that uh, if you have uh, a sequence of uh, number a n which is given, uh, you can build a function which is infinitely smooth f such that all the derivatives at zero are the coefficient a n. Okay, so this is true for any sequence. This is a classical result called Borel theorem. Okay, but now uh, we consider more. So we assume that we have some uh, bound for a n. So typically, like in the previous one, so something similar to that. Okay. So a n is uh, less than c 2 n factorial divided by r to the 2 n. And of course, we would like the function f in addition to this condition to have similar bound. We would like, we would like. So what we obtain is that, okay, we can construct a function which is infinitely smooth with uh, some compact support and which satisfies actually this estimate. So it's similar to this one to the price that we have to add some uh, coefficient R0, uh, and R0 is the, the same number that uh, that appears in our previous result. So it's e to the uh, 2e to the minus 1, and it's uh, some number slightly larger than 1. Okay, so we were able to prove this result. Okay, in some sense, we are a loss, and uh, it's still open to see whether we can get the result with any R0 strictly larger than one. I don't know if it is, if we have this result or not. It's still an open question. And to prove that, we use some uh, nice paper uh, written by Page in uh, 1988. So this kind of result are called borel reed theorem. And for borel reed theorem, I, I refer you to uh, a result by Ramis, Choma Cholet, Tillier. So, these people use complex analysis and Pech use real analysis. Unfortunately, in all the reference, there is nothing about uh, the greatest lower bound of uh, R0. So we, we had to, to do the, this work. So, okay, okay, but this is not the, the, the sharp result about that. So there was a very beautiful result later on. So one result by Dardé Hervé Doza proved in a uh, science journal control and optimization in uh, 2018. And so they considered a square which is slightly larger in the sense that you replace A by one by one plus epsilon. So you increase slightly your square. Huh? And uh, they prove that if you if theta one is holomorphic in this square the, with epsilon uh, strictly positive, then it is reachable from zero with two control. Two control still apply at x equal one and x equal plus one. So the, uh, you have a sufficient condition now, which is closer to the necessary condition, which correspond to epsilon equal zero. So it's much better result. So they don't have a ball; they have a square but with a diagonal, which is slightly larger. And this result was improved. Uh, so, but I have to introduce some notation. So I uh, denote by omega the square. So uh, the square for which one diagonal is minus one, one, okay? And we, we call A2 of omega the intersection of 
uh, all of omega, so, so the set of holomorphic function of omega with the space of L2 uh, square, uh, L, L2 of omega. Okay. So this, it is a set of holomorphic function of on omega that are uh, uh, square integrable as well. Okay. And this space is called actually a Bergman space. Huh? It is a Bergman space. And so what was obtained by Hartmann, Kelly, and Tuxnack in 2018 is that if your space is switchable with two control in L2, then theta1 has to be in N2 of omega. I remind you that in the uh, result of Gevray, it, it was known that theta1 was holomorphic in omega, but also they prove that when the two when the control are in L2 of zero t, then uh, in addition, theta1 has to be square integrable on omega. This is the novelty. Okay. And conversely, so you introduce another space, which is still based on the square. So it is E square of omega. Uh, it, it, it is constituted of uh, the, the, the function theta in uh, A2 of omega that are square. Uh, so in the Bergman space, you assume as well that theta is. Uh, uh, as a trace on uh, omega, which is square integrable, and uh, that you are all these conditions that are satisfied. So you, you integrate theta by Cn, you multiply by Cn, and you integrate on the boundary of the square, and you obtain zero for any n. So it is the same space of the Bergman space, and it is called the Hardy Smirnov space. Okay, so it is a constitute of um, the, the function in uh, the Bergman space satisfying these two conditions. And they prove that if theta 1 is in a, E2 of omega, uh, then it is reachable with two control in L2 of zero. So the novelty is R, you have uh, functions that are holomorphic on the square. You don't need to have a domain which is lar strictly larger than the square. But here you have to add this condition. Okay. And now the sharp result is the following, and it's easy actually to uh, uh, to understand. So you consider still the, uh, as a domain minus one one. You put a control in minus one and in one. So we have two control, and you assume that the two control input h zero and h one are in L two. So they are square integrable, and you still uh, define uh, your uh, square omega. So the same definition as before, and the result, the sharp result obtained by Hartmann and Orsoni in 2021, tells you the following: the reachable space with control in L2 is precisely the Bergman space. So it is a, a2 of omega, which is the intersection, or it, it is the space of holomorphic functions that are square integrable on omega. And to prove that, they use a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And also, they use separation of singularity in Bergman space. Okay. And well, the, these things is interesting. I will tell you that, uh, okay, we can use it again, actually, even for the distributed control. And they obtain, of course, a similar result with only one control as before. So by using a odd function. Okay. So let us have a look now uh, to the, the problem of the reachable states for the distributed control still for the heat equation in dimension one, and it is a joint work with uh, Mo Chen, uh, published in 2022. Okay, so the problem uh, we investigate is the following. So now there is nothing on the boundary, so you take directly boundary condition, but okay, you put some uh, distributed control like this, so you take the characteristic function of uh, the interval L1, L2, where L1 and L2 are uh, between 0 and 1, and you have your control input U, which is a, a distributed function in L2. Okay, so you put a distributed function L2 uh, supported in some part of, of the domain, which is just an interval. You start from 0, and okay, you want to see what are, how are the reachable states. And U is just L2 in time and in space. Alors, to, uh, so to uh, uh, to describe the result, I have to introduce some notation. So as before, we have con to consider uh, some square. So it, here is the square uh, based on the interval minus L uh, 
L, okay? So you, the di one of the diagonal is minus capital L, capital L, and you consider this set, it is a square. And I, I, I call H of L is a, the set of functions F, which are H1 of zero L, and F can be extended uh, as an odd analytic function on the square S of L, okay? So you consider function defined on the interval 0 L, that are H1, and then can be extended as analytic function on, on this square, and also as odd function. So the result we obtain is the following. So you take T larger than 0 and L1, less than L2 and less than 1. So this is the picture. So you have 0, you have 1, you have L1, you have L2. And I remind you that you control uh, between L1 and L2. The distributed control is supported in the interval L1, L2. This is the system. Okay. So your distributed control is supported between L1 and L2. And at 0 and 1, you have directly boundary condition. So first, assume that you, you put any control U, which is uh, L2. Okay. So the solution of your system uh, satisfies the following thing. So the final state, y at time capital T, should be in H10. Of course, it is, uh, 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 it is 0 and 0 and 1 because of the directly bounded condition, but it is also in H1. Uh, it should be H1 everywhere. Okay? It should be H1 everywhere. And you have more than that. Uh, y at time capital T should be in the space HL1 that I defined before. So just to, to, to tell you, so you have this uh, square inside, which is based on uh, uh, minus L1, L1. So in this square inside, the function should be, can be extended as some uh, holomorphic function, and it should be odd with respect to zero. I remind you that on this part, you have no control. Okay, so in some sense, okay, it is a heat equation without control. So on this part, okay, it, it, it should be, it could be um, extended as some holomorphic function, and also this function should be odd with respect to zero. And you have the same for the over and, okay? So y of 1 minus uh, x at time capital T should be in the edge of 1 minus L2. It means that your uh, final function y at time capital T can be extended as some holomorphic function in this uh, square inside, and also as some function which is odd with respect to one. And conversely, now assume that you, you take any uh, small epsilon, you take a function yt in h10, uh, so h10 of 0, 1, and you assume that it is holomorphic, okay, on the, uh, the big uh, square here, and odd with respect to zero, and also holomorphic on the big square here, and holomorphic with respect, and odd with respect to one, then you can reach it. So, uh, more or less, it means that, okay, where you don't have control, it can be extended as some holomorphic function, okay? Where you have the control, it is just H1. And here, again, it is holomorphic. Okay, in the limit case, when L1, L2 is 0, 1, so you control everywhere, you can see that the reachable space is just H1, 0. And uh, to obtain our result, actually, we uh, we use the result we have obtained uh, before. And actually, it is a Hervé Doza uh, uh, Dardé result about the boundary, uh, the boundary control. And you use uh, with that partition of unity, and you can obtain the result for distributed control. Huh? And so we will give actually a short and new proof of Dardé Hervé-Doza results. So I, I remind you uh, what is the definition of this uh, of this square S of L. Okay, and uh, this is actually a Dardé Hervé-Doza result, but we prove it in a different way. So you consider uh, okay some function which is holomorphic on this square when L is larger than one, then. Okay, it's some reachable state, and you you can actually construct a control input that are the pair of order two. And we need it uh, after in our proof, so it is the pair of order two uh, for this control problem. So a new proof of uh, Dardé Hervé-Doza result is the following. Actually, there are two steps. I think it's interesting to see that. So the, the first step is the separation of singularity. 
So I introduce again the square based on the uh, on the interval minus L capital L. Okay. So the, consider, for instance, this uh, this square, the, the big square. Actually, it, it is it will be a bigger square, but okay, it's similar to this one. Okay. So this is a square, and next we introduce this uh, notation: uh, omega of theta r is uh, a neighborhood of the line. Um, in the direction with the angle theta. So typically, okay, if you have some angle theta with respect to the uh, axis of the abscissa, okay, you, you consider a neighborhood, so the, the point that are some uh, distance uh, at most r of, uh, of, the, of your line, okay? So you obtain band like this, okay? Okay, so the result tells you that Actually, you can separate the singularity in the sense that if you have some holomorphic function on the big square, then uh, in the small square, you can split the function into two, the sum of two holomorphic functions, C1 and C2, one which is defined in this band, which is very large, and the other one which is defined on this band, which is also very large. And you split the singularity in the sense that, okay, if you are a function defined on, on this uh, square, which is holomorphic, it could be pole in this place, in this place, in this place, everywhere. Of course, everywhere outside the square. But, okay, but you can split as the sum of two functions that, uh, so the function C1, say, is defined this way, and it does not have any pole in this bond. And the other one does not have any pole in this bond, okay? This is what is called a separation of singularity for holomorphic function. So now, uh, more uh, uh, more precisely, so, so assume that L is some uh, length which is uh, larger than one and strictly uh, uh, smaller than capital L, and you have uh, some holomorphic function on the square based on capital L. So you can find two angles. Uh, some R and some holomorphic function, so on the blue part and on the red part, such that first the so the small uh, square uh, is included in the intersection of the two bands, which is the case here. The function uh, C1 and C2 are holomorphic, but also they are bonded together with uh, the first derivative. Okay, and finally C is the sum of the two uh, holomorphic function. And actually, to prove that is very easy. The, the idea is just to use Cauchy formula. So you use some pass, huh? uh, like this one, actually, it is this one. And so you have this Cauchy formula. And next, you split the integral. So uh, the pass, you have, for instance, this part of the pass and this part of the pass. And when you consider uh, the contribution of this part, you can see that the function it will be holomorphic on, the, on this band. And for the other part, so you have this part and this part, when you consider so the contribution of this integral, you will see that you have a function which is homomorphic in this part. So it's completely explicit, actually. And it's not mysterious, it's just you split this integral and you obtain at once uh, C1 and C2. So this is the first part, separation of singularity. And the second part is integration of the heat kernel along uh, an oblique line. So the, more or less the problem is to uh, solve uh, the uh, back the backward uh, heat equation. So you want to solve the heat equation for negative time, huh? not for positive time, but for negative time. So of course, you can solve the heat equation uh, for positive time by using a convolution with the heat kernel, something which is similar to that. But here, instead of integrating over R over the over the, this set here, we will integrate over some oblique line. Okay some line like this. And thanks to that, uh, we can actually solve the heat equation backward in time. I mean, with a negative uh, value of the time. So I just introduce the notation. So we introduce uh, O of theta R, which is a set of function, uh, the set of Z, uh, which is in the ball, centered at R e to the I theta, and with reduce R. So it is the blue disk, here and uh, it's very easy that, to see that when theta is larger than um, uh, uh, larger than pi over two and less than three pi over two, so like in this picture, for instance, huh, um, you, what will you obtain is that this ball will intersect the uh, semi-axis 
corresponding to the negative time. Okay, so you see that you have some intersection which is non-empty, and actually, so with this formula, you you can see that you can solve formally the uh, heat equation with actually the variables that are in some uh, uh, complex domain, both z which is the space and tau, which is the time. But uh, what is important that the, the time tau can assume negative value. And when the time tau tends to zero, you recover psi. Okay, so you use that and by using these two ingredients, you can prove the result. Okay, I, I think I will stop here now. Thank you for your attention.